So I hope you share my enthusiasm with, with data science, both here at the Research Park, at the University of Illinois, and of course, in just in general. Uh, so now it's my great pleasure, though, to introduce our morning keynote speaker, uh, my friend, Professor Verity Winship. I first met Verity uh, through IDSI. She may be regretting uh, <laughs> bringing her on board. Uh, but she's on the steering committee for the IDSI. She's been a very valuable asset on that. Uh, she's a graduate of the Harvard Law School, where she served as executive editor for the Harvard Law Review. Uh, she's performed several impressive clerkships. She practiced law in New York City. But fortunately for us, she saw the light, uh, and she, she came to academia. Uh, she's currently a full professor at the College of Law here at the University of Illinois. Uh, she's one of the most dynamic and interesting speakers I've ever uh, had the pleasure to listen to. Uh, I, I like to tease her, though, that, that you, her voice may be very familiar to some of you. Uh, she is the uh, uh, voice for legal issues in the news on WIL Public Radio, so you may have heard her uh, waxing uh, about many of the issues that are confronting uh, society today. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Gary Hitchin. speaker <laughs> trying to make it through the next half an hour because I like to set expectations a little low, especially at the, at the outset. Um, but thank you. I am I'm very Winship. I'm a professor at the University of Illinois uh, College of Law, so down the block. And um, although this talk is called Data Law, uh, my uh, area of expertise or, or what I study is, is mostly private litigation and government enforcement, especially in corporate and securities areas. And so uh, it's mostly what happens when things go wrong, including when data governance uh, goes wrong. So we'll come back to that. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, of where I'm coming from and where, uh, where uh, my interests lie. As I was preparing this, I, I gave it a lot of thought. And I also, uh, part of my thought was, it's whatever, eight something, uh, and it is the first in a long and intense and interesting day. And so I uh, wanted to think about how, how to deal with that, how, what would really wake you up. And so I thought, you know, coffee, chat, or tea, morning run, whatever, that's up to you. There's coffee in the back. Um, that's fine. A funny story would really be great, but uh, that's not really what I'm good at. So let's, <laughs> you don't want to see that. Um, I am much more of a serious lawyer type, a serious law professor type, so no. Um, but then I thought, look, the answer is actually obvious. I know exactly what gets the adrenaline going from my work as a professor, from, from being a teacher. And, um, and that's a pop quiz. So clear your desks, okay? Um, I, that's what we're going to do. It's not great if I see some sort of stunned faces, but um, yeah. it's not going to be graded. And actually, we'll start with a fairly uh, factual question. Here's question one. This is a show of hands, but it's just a factual question. Are you suing Facebook? Okay, for, for data breach. And I'm not asking, I don't want to know secret information, I don't want to know inside company information, no. And I'm not going to call on you. I just want to see, are you suing Facebook? Show of hands, yes. Raise your hand if yes. <laughs> Two people? Okay, uh, let me ask, well, let me ask a follow-up question. Are you a person in Illinois? Yes, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Uh, so, there's a, if the answer is yes, you're suing Facebook. So, we didn't do so well on the first question. Okay. And I'll show you why. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Robert, you did well, but um, I expect that of you. Uh, here's, here's the complaint. So, this is an example. Um, in March of 2018, so last spring, we had the state's attorney of, of Cook County, Illinois filed a lawsuit in Illinois State Court on behalf of the people of the state of Illinois. And um, this particular one, and we'll talk about it a little uh, later, is, is against Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, so coming out, out of those events that we'll look at in a second. So we're still on question one. Here's another follow-up question. Do you use Facebook? Yes. 
Okay, so then, yeah, so you were really wrong on question one about whether you were suing Facebook, and I'll show you, this is just another example. Um, here is a class action. Um, this is, here's the nature of the case. Uh, it is uh, a uh, class action against uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica again. And in our country, you could be a member of a class action, uh, whether you know it or not. You might know in the end, but uh, you have uh, probably sued Facebook for, in this way too. So you're suing not just once, um, and frankly, not, not just twice. And so we'll see, we'll see this in a second. There you are. Okay. <laughs> At this point, let's backtrack a little bit. I just, uh, I said these are both, both of these examples are from the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which in scandal terms is ancient history, uh, but in litigation terms is actually, it's a good time to look at this example because these things take time to see how it shakes out and to see who's suing and, and for what. And um, the underlying events, I don't, I don't expect you to be able to read this. This is uh, the Cambridge Analytica webpage. I will enlarge a little bit of it. There we go. Um, the, the basic allegations, if you remember, were that Cambridge Analytica had engaged in this psychographic targeting for political messages, and particularly on the Republican side in the 2016 presidential election. So this was a very political scandal in some ways. Uh, Steve Bannon was on the board of Cambridge Analytica. There was some Mercer money in the mix. Um, so it was a political scandal, um, but it was also a data scandal. And in particular, uh, a number of people filled in the psychological profile, um, but the information gathered was much broader. If you remember, um, up to 87 million Facebook users uh, had their data uh, accessed uh, through this. And here, um, here is Zuckerberg pensively preparing for a congressional testimony. And what does he say? He says, look, uh, sorry, we, we really didn't do enough. Um, and this particular response is it's in the context of this Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge Analytica uh, standard. Okay. I read the other day that uh, he may have to go back to Congress to do it again. Uh, so this is something that is ongoing, an ongoing problem, as we know from both our context as, as users of data, but also as producers and, uh, and uh, um, keepers of data. Okay. Are you ready for question two? This is, question one did not go so well, but we're still gonna try it. <coughs> question two. Um, this is about Cambridge Analytica, but it basically could be any privacy breach. We could think of the same thing. And at the, at the risk of making you recall the standardized tests from days of yore, uh, here is the question. Facebook allegedly violated all of the following except and here's the list. Invasion of privacy. So this is the list. If you looked at the complaints, so if you looked at the legal documents, these are the things you would see. They say, you violated this law, and you violated this law, and this law, and this law. And we're trying to identify on this list, we're trying to identify the one that they did not allegedly violate, okay? Data law, conversion, which is basically theft of, of property, Negligence, sort of lack of lack of care. Uh, Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO. I don't know if uh, you've heard of this, but this is it came out uh, really for mob uh, organized crime to address organized crime. Federal Wiretap Act, GDPR, uh, your favorite. Um, GDPR. Okay, so let's think for a second. Which of these? are not on the list. So which of these was Facebook not uh, uh, accused of, alleged, what was not alleged against Facebook? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Because we're a big group, I'm gonna go one by one, and I just wanna see if this is the one you would fill in, if this is the oval that you would fill in, I wanna see the show of hands, okay? Uh, invasion of privacy, not accused of invasion of privacy. Okay, a couple takers. Not accused of violation of data law. Okay, a little bit bigger. Uh, not accused of conversion. 
I'm not going to call on you, <laughs> and I'm not really keeping track. So <laughs> you're okay. Uh, negligence. Not accused of negligence. I see a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Racket of Rico. Not accused of Rico. Okay. A couple. Good. Uh, federal Wiretap Act. Not accused of federal of violation of federal wiretap. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, and GDPR. Not accused of GDPR. Okay. We'll talk about that one in a second. Um, okay. Uh, I saw a lot of hands for um, for data law. Why data law? Does anybody want to defend their hand here? What is data law? I hear from Robert. Yeah? There's no such thing. That's right. So you guys, this is much too sophisticated an audience, but I'm glad to see we're doing better on question two, right? Um, here we go. Data law. There is no such thing. I call my talk data law. Not as a joke, I'm not going to say that, but just as a, let's talk about what it could be if it existed. It's not, it doesn't exist. And so no, um, not, a, not a violation of data law. Um, can you guess this? There's actually another one on this list that for Cambridge Analytica is not, uh, was not alleged. Any, uh, any guesses? Yeah? GDPR. GDPR, why? Okay, she says, uh, GDPR, why it's just timing, did not go in, into effect, and in fact, it didn't until May 25th, 2018. The conduct was done, okay? And so I have a little dotted line around this, but we could circle it. It's just a timing, but it doesn't tell us as much about what kind of legal allegations and what, what law is, is governing here. Okay, so you guys did pretty well on that. Um, I'll show you, this is not, uh, I'm just going back to this slide to say, this is not an exclusive list of the allegations of violation. And in fact, it would, it would take much more time than it is worth to go through and list every single law that was alleged to have been violated by Facebook, even in the single event, so even in the Cambridge Analytica event alone. And I'll show you why. Uh, this, is, this is an example just from a single complaint. So this is, the complaint is the formal legal document that starts a lawsuit. And this is a single complaint. This actually, you all should be familiar with because you're the plaintiff here. This is, you shouldn't be familiar with it. But this is an example of a class action that you may be bringing yourself. Um, and here we can see some examples. There's the Federal Wiretap Act. I saw a couple people had doubts. This doesn't mean it's gonna win. Uh, these are allegations, but the potential violation of Federal Wiretap Act. Uh, Stored Communications Act, that wasn't even on my list. Uh, California Unfair Competition Law, so we see the states in the mix. Uh, here we have negligence. Um, invasion of Privacy, which is judge-made law uh, with a couple of different factors, but basically made by the courts, common law. Um, Ca uh, California Consumer Records Act, and uh, conversion, which is conversion of property, basically theft in some, in some sense. Okay, here's the second complaint. This actually, who else was unhappy with Facebook? Well, investors in Facebook uh, were pretty unhappy about this, and this particular example is um, investors of Facebook suing the officers and directors of Facebook, and here we see a different array um, still coming out. These are just Cambridge Analytica, Facebook examples. They're coming out of the same events. And here we have a breach of fiduciary duty uh, against these uh, officers. Uh, we have um, insider stock uh, uh, trading, insider uh, stock sales, unfair profits, and then various SEC or securities laws and rules uh, in action. And here I'll show you this, what you are seeing is basically the credits running of all of the complaints filed on the basis of this uh, particular event. So I could, that's why I did not make a full list of all of the allegations. Uh, and this is just the private plaintiffs. And frankly, it doesn't include the 50 plus. If somebody wants to look at them, we've put together a collection, happy to share it. But um, this doesn't even include the full list of litigants, users, and investors, 
and uh, various other entities that have sued Facebook for this particular action. Uh, it, it leaves out the international part, so uh, UK was in the mix as well. Find, uh, it fined Facebook 500,000 pounds for violating its Data Protection Act. Uh, also not on the list uh, of, of different violations. Okay, so users of Facebook were obviously really angry about this use of data. Investors in Facebook were not particularly thrilled. Um, and you saw the credit list for that. And the allegations, some said you violated our privacy. Some said you acted uh, irresponsibly using our money. This is the investors uh, in Facebook. And so far, this is just the private actors. Um, the, uh, there are government actors in the mix as well. And so federal agencies, and state enforcers were also interested. And so actually top of the list uh, was the Federal Trade Commission um, that had, was enforcing, bringing in a government enforcement action against Facebook. Uh, and one of the things that made the, this particular agency very mad was that they had already uh, punished or uh, punished Facebook in 2012. So they had entered an agreement uh, where Facebook basically said, uh, we're going to put in place a lot, we're going to improve our privacy practices. Here are all the things we're going to do to fix this problem. And they entered a formal agreement to resolve that. Uh, you know, however many years later, here we are, it's a repeat offender. And so the FTC was not very thrilled about that. And they opened an investigation following uh, the disclosure of this. They're not alone. Um, what I have up here actually are the state attorneys general. So uh, basically the law enforcement lawyer for the particular states. This is uh, right after Cambridge Analytica, so last spring. Uh, they wrote to Facebook demanding information. These are the signatures, a couple of uh, open investigation, um, et cetera. And this actually, I'll show you this one. This is my favorite from the time. This is the Massachusetts attorney general. And um, I've left the, the contact information uh, in for this, uh, probably for obvious reasons. It's that you can't live with them, you can't live without them. Of course, Facebook is one of her, contact, uh, her, her contacts. Okay. You get the picture. Multiple regulators, multiple laws, and it's all about handling data. There is no single data law. Look, you know, Facebook is a repeat defendant. If you say Cambridge Analytica, that was very politicized, that's not a good example. Well, we can come up with other examples. This is about location services and misuse of location services from October. Probably if we looked up uh, current events, we could find other examples. Um, we could also look at other companies. So Facebook may be not typical. I mean, it's using information. We don't pay for the services. We're, we're basically selling our, our privacy, selling our data in some indirect way. Um, so maybe that's different. Uh, you know, Google is on this suit as, as well. Um, and I'll show you, I'm gonna show you an example. I'll show you this. This is just to make the point that, you know, we can, we can say Facebook is unusual, uh, data breach is unusual, but this basic uh, setting of multiple regulators and multiple uh, restrictions or multiple sources of law uh, is familiar from all sorts of contexts. This particular slide is of financial services and regulation in financial services. Um, it's a little, you have to be a little, take it with a grain of salt, because if you look at the bottom, uh, the source of it is, is J.P. Morgan Chase, so it's partially a complaint about how many, uh, how many regulators and how many regulations there are for the different parts of the business. Uh, but we can see this, uh, FinTech is actually a good example of, of a growing area um, that is uh, regulated by many, many different regulators. And so, uh, you know, FinTech itself is somewhat amorphous concept. It's, uh, at its broadest, is this uh, any use of technology in the financial sector. Uh, so you might expect a fairly broad range of regulators. Um, but you get this kind of picture, uh, same thing. 
50 states and other jurisdictions who uh, remember the California unfair practices or California consumer protection or Illinois consumer law. I didn't show you that from, the, uh, from your first lawsuit that you brought against Facebook, but that is, uh, that's the Illinois consumer law. And you see this uh, pattern in other contexts as well. You know, state, this is the FinTech example as well, just to give a sense from a different context of many, many regulators as well, depending on the type of business and the type of service, but you have all of the financial regulators, the SEC, um, both making rules about it, but also bringing enforcement actions, like the FTC one in the context of, of Cambridge Analytica. Are we, are we ready for question three? It's even more ominous. It's question 3A. Um, but you get, the, you get the basic idea. We've got multiple regulators, multiple laws, and no data law. Okay. Question 3A. And this requires reading, so we can take a pause to, to take a look at this. Identify this paragraph. Okay. Take a look and just tell me what it is. There was a request for more coffee. There is more coffee in the back if you need it for your for these questions. <laughs> okay, do you want to answer this? I think it's one of the disclaimers and one of the pick through uh, licenses for some pieces of software that could be used. Okay, is this the, okay, here's another question. Yes, so he says it must be a piece of one of those licenses, but nobody ever reads them. Have you ever read, read this before? So either this provision or a, have you read the terms and agreements? Yes. Okay, so come to me after. I want to talk to you. But um, often, uh, <laughs> Uh, this particular example is just from, um, it's just, it's an iTunes agreement. It may not even be the most current. I mean, it, it is able to change. Uh, built into the contract is this idea that it can change whenever, uh, whenever Apple wants it to. So uh, this is an example. What is it? So you read it and you recognize the legalese. I didn't start with this, right? That was good. I didn't start, this is not question one. So what, um, what is it actually doing? Can you tell from the, uh, from the text? This is a reading question, really. Limiting liability. Limiting liability, yeah. Um, and I, I really, um, I had not seen this before. I didn't read this particular one, although as a law professor, I probably read more of these than other people. Um, it, limiting it to fifty dollars, uh, I didn't know that. Um, did you agree to this? Okay, so here's we'll do another show of hands. So limitation of liability. Um, did you agree to this? Yes. Okay, so are you limited to fifty bucks of recovery? Yes. I see some, okay, I see a little discrepancy between the number of people who agreed to this and the number of people who think they're limited to 50 bucks. Does anybody, you didn't raise your hand on the second one. Anyone want to address that? Why do you, if you agree to it? Yes? Because it's clear that everybody automatically does that in order to get access to the service. And because the legal uh, attest that any reasonable person wouldn't understand what they've done, a good lawyer ought to be able to say this is worthless. Because it because no one read it, is that the uh... because, because there was so much on the level that in order to obtain service, <laughs> you couldn't possibly have understood what you were doing. What is your option? So what's the other option besides clicking on it? Not using the service. Okay, that's right. Um, that is that's 
basically the legal justification for binding you to this, is that you did have an option. You could have said no, to, or just said no and just not use the service. Now we know, I saw that show of hands for Facebook, and we could do the same thing for other services. We frankly could do it for non-data related services if you have a, a credit card or a, a, a cell phone or something like that. We'd have exactly the same issue. Um, but the, the point here is this is considered contract. Uh, and not only do we have this web of different legal sources when we're dealing with data, we also have this overlay of contract and contract law. And many times, um, there are some things you can't contract about, okay? So you can't have a binding contract with a hitman. It just, no. And you can't have a contract to sell your organs, okay? There are a couple things, you know, binding uh, some uh, lease where you say you're gonna run a meth lab out of your apartment, no. Okay, there are some contracts that we don't permit for public policy, but notice that the list is pretty extreme. The list is not, we don't allow you to limit your liability or agree to sue in California courts or all of the little, all of the details that you would find if you dig into these. Um, and so for the most part, we're gonna see uh, this treated as contract. Even if we sort of feel like that can't be true, we aren't reading it, we aren't doing, uh, we don't expect, except in this context where I expect you all to read it, or in, for my students, uh, we don't expect people to read it. It's not a reasonable expectation. But nonetheless, we have a lot of law out there that treats these as binding. We could do this for a long time. You know how many of these are out there. So this is just uh, this is just a different example. This is Google. Um, limit to the amount you paid us to use the services. Sometimes that might be zero. I don't know. I think it might be broader. This, uh, but I, I wanted to flag that one. We have the same issue. We have the same question. You are not reading them. Only sort of people in eccentric situations, like you know, law professors, are reading these uh, these terms, or people whose business it is to monitor these terms or to draft these terms uh, is also a category that are looking at them. Uh, this one is, even too, is too small for any of us to read. Um, this is just about the rights to information that you, you hand over, and uh, um, again, in the, in the policies. So putting that together, so putting these three questions together, uh, part of the point is we have lots of sources of law, um, and including contract and including this overlay, there are a lot of things we allow people to agree to that we don't, uh, that aren't something in statute, right? We allow people to give up certain rights in contract. We allow people to waive a day in court in contract. And in our legal system, at least right now, we're very friendly to contract. And we're very broad about how we think about consent. And that, it, that impacts uh, this particular uh, context. I think the only place I saw a company back down was, um, and this may be a rumor, so uh, an unnamed serial company uh, had this idea that maybe we could do this. If you open the serial box, then you agree to blah, 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 to the long list of, of terms. And people did not like that. Um, and so just from consumer reaction, they, they said, never mind, it's not that important to us. Uh, that seems like consent, mm, opening, maybe not. Uh, but we have some equipment. All right, so here's our challenge. And um, we could go back to the initial slide. I mean, maybe we could, we could edit this. Maybe we say data laws. That's, that's a better title, or data law, data law, or maybe, I'm not gonna say this, but just, you know, that's, that may be how we, where we are at this point in the talk. Okay, and part of the implication of this is there's not one person who knows the answer to all of these questions, uh, including all of the legal questions. Sometimes you think, well, I just need to find that one person who is going to be able to tell me what to do with this data. And in some ways, uh, that is, that's not entirely true. 
Um, I, when I was thinking about this talk, I, t I had a conversation with someone who worked on the defense side as a lawyer uh, in data breach suits. And um, what he told me was there are pockets of, of definitive law. So HIPAA, you know, a, a lot in this context, we think of that a lot. Uh, GDPR is on everybody's minds. There are pockets of definitive law. But these are, and in, you should be listening to your lawyers, compliance officers, in no way am I taking away from them. Um, but there are lots of areas where this is much more like the Wild West. We're kind of making it up as we go along. Uh, the companies are, the lawyers are, and the regulators are uh, figuring it out uh, as we go along. You can sort of see this with the complaints, the legal complaints, and sort of figuring out what kind of existing law deals with a problem that is somewhat new, or somewhat, uh, at least in scale, is new. Okay. I, I don't mean this as discouraging. I don't think I was supposed to have, like, discourage everybody at the beginning of the day. It was not my, my task. Um, but actually what it's meant as is more of a call of act to action. And so a lot of times people don't think of the law as this kind of area. But it is actually a call to innovation and collaboration in figuring out what we're going to do about these problems and in figuring out how to deal with it responsibly and ethically and thoughtfully and, and legally. Where, there is, where there's definitive law, obviously we want it. Uh, to be within those bounds as well. And so I'm putting up uh, this. This is just what we're doing here today. And so for me, this is the right way to start the day. It's, yeah, it's a scared straight story of all the things that go wrong and how terrible it is and how there's no data law. But on the other hand, it is why sitting in this room for this day and for this day uh, in, in, over the years is worthwhile. It is because we all have roles in figuring out what to do. Uh, here, lawyers have roles, but, um, but all of us do. Okay, so I want to suggest uh, for my last, uh, they're going to have to put the, bring out the hook. I, I'm not keeping an eye on this. But for, for the last few minutes, I just want to suggest a couple places where you might see intervention. In, or where you might see uh, this problem addressed, this problem of sort of how to deal with data responsibly. Uh, technology. And so a number of the panels and a number of, of the, uh, the talks today deal with this. Uh, it may be new law. I mean, maybe we need data law. Maybe it should be a thing. Uh, so maybe we could create that. Uh, and then this big category of industry and company-led ethics and compliance and best practices, I think, is a, is a big category. Technology, here's our, there. There's Facebook, but it could be any company. The arrows, they could be litigation. They could be enforcement. That's how I think of it because of, of the area I'm interested in. But they could also be sources of regulation or different rules that you're trying to comply with. Uh, and one possibility is technological. And so I think um, when I hear people talking about data provenance and different ways of dealing with that data itself and making it easier to comply or easier to track about how, uh, how much information or where it's coming from, um, for me, this is in that category of a technological way to make, uh, to address this problem of, of data governance, of uh, figuring out what to do responsibly with this data. Uh, another piece of this may be um, reg tech, soup tech, there's probably, we could have law tech, I, I don't know if anybody's doing that, maybe it's too broad, but the idea is we don't just have uh, technology and data on the end of the companies and the industry, we also have it, um, it when we're dealing, as a way of dealing with the regulations, maybe we could have a technological uh, way of addressing that. Or on the supervisory role, um, maybe we could have a way of dealing with technology on the supervisor, or the, uh, uh, the agencies and regulator side, soup tech. I, I think that's how we're going to say it. Um, another possibility, and that's, 
that's not my area, but I open it up because I think uh, having heard people talk in, in more technical areas, uh, I think that's one thing that is on people's minds is what can we do on the data end of this? Um, do we need all of this data? Do we have to be generating this data? Maybe a question, particularly as things like GDPR come through and people have, have to be able to trace back uh, the data of, of particular users. Um, I would say probably a fantasy world is the single regulation data law. There it is, the big arrow. You just have to have one person who tells you what to do. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and frankly, there, there's some reasons why that would not be a good idea. It would be very hard to do, but it would also be, um, there's some reasons to have overlap and, and different expertise coming from different, different places. Um, I think actually, even if we got rid of regulation, we'd still have the problem. We wouldn't get rid of this uh, uh, multiple requirement problem. Uh, it would look a little different, but basically you still have the consumers and you still have the, the uh, concerned about their data. You still have non-US laws. You, st you still have GDPR. You still have these, uh, um, and data is sometimes without national borders. And so we have to deal with that as well. Um, I think a lot of this is going to come from inside the companies. Compliance, uh, in some ways, I think this is a, uh, in, in particular, risk-based compliance. So looking at this very sources of regulation and really thinking, what do I have to be most attentive to? What am I going to, uh, what, what do I need to comply with? And then uh, working your way down into some sort of assessment of priorities uh, within the company. Uh, best practices, so this is true in many areas. But uh, this lends itself particularly to it because we aren't, we don't have the uh, the full legal structure here. Uh, and then ethics and law. So uh, part of this, uh, it's a little different point than the compliance point. Compliance, we think we want to follow the law. We need to set it up so we're complying with the law. When we're thinking about ethics, we're broadening it a little bit. Even if it is legal, what do we do? with people's data? How do we respect uh, privacy? How do we do this? And so a little broader, and I think we should aspire to that. I've added a little circles. Uh, just to say, um, industry-wide, this isn't just a, a company example. So I'll show you uh, two, two examples of what this might look like. Um, one is that this is actually from the FTC. So the, um, this is the regulatory response. And it, this is from 2012 when Facebook first made an agreement with, uh, with the agency. And the FTC puts out this guidance and basically says, look, if you don't want to be in trouble like Facebook, here's what you do. And here's what a good set of privacy practices looks like. And it, and it goes through and, and lists uh, really best practices, but here coming from a regulator. Not mandatory, but in that kind of guidance mode. Here is a more Recent example, this isn't uh, no content here, but you can see, I mean, a number of people uh, actually in this room, their companies, and you see oath up there, you see some examples there. Uh, this is uh, the practical, this is uh, ITI, an industry group, that made a framework to advance interoperable rules. FAIR is the acronym on privacy. And you can see the member companies here. Uh, this came out late October. So a, a, recent, uh, a recent effort in this area. So I call this talk data law. Um, there's no such thing. Good job on question two. Uh, instead, we have this multiple regulator, multiple requirement. And the response is really collaborative work that has to be done to build the infrastructure, to build the legal infrastructure and the other infrastructure. Uh, for responsible and innovative data use. Uh, and one of the building blocks is this kind of event, the, the presentations and conversations here. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you.
Thanks for that, that presentation. Appreciate that. It, as, as we're sharing, it makes you think about the handling of public data versus private data and the, the interaction that we have projects that we deal with that have private data but also have public data. Do you think that this sets a standard with happened with Facebook that companies can no longer use public data to influence behavior? Or when you have public data, a lot of there, there's APIs out there where you can access a lot of data. It's just how you use that public data. How would you speak to that? So I think it's a good question. I, I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to advertise a panel later in the day, <laughs> um, which is we have a governance panel later in the day. And I think it's a question that's come up in that context. Uh, in that context is how do you deal with that mix of it? And how, how do you deal with the fact that we have a lot of laws about the questions you can ask, like uh, questions about a person's marital status, questions about, but we no longer have to ask that. We can just know that from the date, from other pieces of data. And so I think I've seen that question come up and, and be addressed in, in that context. So I'm gonna point you, you should go, I'm looking it up, 215, data governance and responsible computing and ask it there. And don't tell my colleague that I told you to do that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. In the era of fake news, how would you deal with fake data? Oh, with fake data? Is there a way to distinguish fake data from real data? From the, from the law. From the law, from the legal end. I think part of that, this is a, an example. You know, my answer is going to be, I don't know to all of these. I will just give you the preview. But um, the, uh, I think part of it, this is one of those places where it's got to be not just the lawyers. Because there's, there has to be some way of figuring out what is, what is fake and what is not. I mean, at the extremes. So I see the law as addressing some of the extremes. So addressing the hate speech. And once you're in that realm, you're within the legal constraints. Um, once you are sort of selling somebody else's uh, data in a, uh, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to give an example, but uh, in some sort of extreme way, then you're going to be in the legal constraints. What is more difficult is that there's something short of that. And so unless, and that's going to be where we need to have some, some way of identifying it and some sort of practice with that. So I'm not sure a law alone is going to, is going to address the fake news, the, the fake news issue. All right, thank you. Thank you.